said, now what you are missing, I give it to you. I give you power and I give you authority. We begin as an introduction to note that Jesus Christ referred to his body as the temple. He referred to his body as a temple. Our body is also referred to as a temple. Apostle Paul refers to our body as a temple. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he says that you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? All right? So there in verse 19, or 1 Corinthians 6, he says that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus also referred to his body as a temple. In John chapter 2, verse 19, he referred to his body as a temple. He said, I will destroy this temple, and in three days I will build it up again. All right? So these guys who are listening to him, they thought he was talking about the temple of Herod. The temple in Jerusalem at that particular time was called the temple of Herod. Herod's temple. Because the temple that was built by Solomon, if you remember, had been destroyed. All right? Had been de destroyed by the Babylonians when they were taking them captive. The articles of the temple had been plundered. You remember the story of, of King Darius who was using the utensils of the temple to drink and the handwriting appeared on the wall. Mene mene tekel parasin means your kingdom has been weighed and found wanting. You remember all that background? So after that, they came back. And that is where Haggai, people like Ezra, Haggai, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, of course, was building the temple, uh, I mean the wall of Jerusalem, Ezra, the temple, but Haggai was to cause them to again begin where they had stopped and finished the temple. Praise God. Somewhere after that, all right, somewhere after that, in between Malachi and uh, Matthew, Herod came in and helped to finish and to, you know, just renovate the temple a bit as a way of pleasing the children of Israel. Now, you need to understand that from the time of David, the kings of Israel were genealogical. They were kingship in Israel was inherited. So Solomon was the king of David. I mean, was the son of David, King David, on and on and on until they went into captivity and there was no king in Israel at that particular time because all of them were in captive, captivity. But somewhere in between, you know, uh, uh, around the quiet years or the dark ages, these people, the, the, the Romans, when they came, they appointed a king who was friendly, who would help them to manage the Jews. And now this king was not of the tribe of Judah. All right? He wasn't of the tribe of Judah. He was just a guy who was picked from one of, you know, uh, the tribes of Israel and, you know, uh, 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 Hebrew and uh, was made a king. And that explains to you why he was so jealous when he heard that there is a king that has been born, the king of the Jews. That is why he, because he knew, genealogically speaking, he didn't have a right to that throne. Are you getting me? So he wanted, in, in fact, he went on and killed all the boys except one, and that is Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, I will destroy this temple, in John chapter 2 verse 19, these people thought he was talking about that temple. And they said, this temple took us 46 years. And that's where Herod comes in to help them. Are you getting? Says, this temple took, there it is. The Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. 
And will you raise it up in three days? All right. But he was speaking of what? What was he talking about? He was speaking of the temple of his body. So Jesus referred to his body as a temple. So that's number one. We need to note that. As we are looking at Christ and the tabernacle, we begin by understanding that Jesus referred to his body as a temple. Now, I want to also tell you something. The articles and the compartments of the temple were the same as the tabernacle. After the temple was built, there are things that did not change. The Ark of the Covenant, for example. You understand? That did not change. And, and, and the things that were, were supposed to be inside. So what Solomon did, uh, through what David had prepared and provided for the building, is that he built a temple. So the difference here is permanency. Are you getting? Is permanency. In the wilderness, they used a tabernacle because it was easy to pull it down and to carry it. Talking about their wandering. Talking about being sojourners. Praise God. And that is why Jesus is talking about his body being a temple and not a tabernacle. Are you getting? It's, it's because of the idea of permanency. Amen. That you can't, you move from Jesus, you go where else. Are, are you getting my point? So, the difference that in the tabernacle, and those appreciate uh, the bad media, they are giving us some pictures there. These things were in the tabernacle. They were also in the temple. So the difference was that the temple was made of stone. The temple was permanent. All right? The temple did not move. But the tabernacle, they carried it everywhere they went. When they crossed the Jordan, they crossed, they, they, they crossed the Jordan with the tabernacle. There were people, Levites. And that is one of the reasons why God needed a whole tribe. Because they would pull it down, fold it in order. Fold the parts of the tabernacle in order. There were people who were carrying the pegs and putting them aside. and There was a lot of order. Are you getting? So when they started to cross over, they were carrying the tabernacle. All right? Many times we, we just read and, and about the Ark of the Covenant. When those who bore the Ark of the Covenant touched the, the brinks of the water or, or the river, uh, the water parted. That, that's all we read. But you need to understand, it's not only the Ark of the Covenant they were carrying. They were carrying the entire tabernacle, but it had been folded. Until where the cloud, the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire stopped and they camped there and they put the tabernacle there and they started to worship there and sacrifice until the next time that the cloud shall move and Moses shall give them direction and tell them it's time to move. So they went and started to unpeg it and fold the robes, the you know, the badger skin, because the covering was the covering was made of badger skin, was, was made of skin. Are you, are you getting me? So that's the major difference. Okay? So the temple was fixed and permanent. So symbolizing the end of the era of movement and wandering. It talks about establishment that they had been settled. They had entered into their inheritance. So the temple signifies the fact that they had arrived where God was taking them and this is what God wanted to give them. All right? So they, they were not expected at some point to pluck up the temple and move. All right? When they arrived and finally David conquered Jerusalem, the next thing we see David doing is planning to build a temple because God had finally brought them to where he promised that he would take them. So they were no longer en route. They were no longer wandering. They were no longer sojourners. They had arrived 
to the land that God had promised to them. All right? And that's the same thing you see. And this is what I keep on saying, that when Adam, when God created Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden. Are you hearing me? But when God cre- uh, delivered the children of Israel from Egypt, he gave them Canaan. He gave them the promised land. That was their inheritance. Amen. But when me and you are born again, we were redeemed and born again in Jesus Christ. We are put in Christ. So Christ is the sphere of our existence. Are, are you getting me? So it's a permanent, all right? So Jesus is, although we are talking about Christ in the tabernacle, because it was there, it was the original one that was built by Moses. But we see Christ in terms of permanency. And that's what we see from his priesthood. That his priesthood is not changing. His sacrifice is not changing. There is not another sacrifice that he is coming to offer. All right? That he has already done it once and for all. Amen. Whatever he did, his sacrifice, his shed blood is once and for all. He has secured an eternal salvation. An eternal redemption for you and for me. Are you following me? Praise the name of Jesus. So it means when you come to Christ, you settle there. You settle in Christ. Bonas if you Also, it's a type of fulfillment. As I told you, the temple signified arrival. It signified that where God was taking us, we have arrived. We are not moving from here. If you're following me, say amen. Hallelujah. So Jesus refers to his body as a temple. Yeah? So the temple, the tabernacle was made of skin, as I've said, and was temporary so that they could carry it and dismantle it and put it up again easily. Now the other thing is, we see the Apostle Paul referring to Jesus Christ and his body in terms of some of the articles or parts of the temple. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 20, the Bible says, go go to verse 19, let's begin there. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, By the blood of who? By the blood of Jesus. Now he's telling us, he's telling us to do what only high priests were allowed to do. And this is, these are some of the problems that the Jews had with Paul. These are some of the issues they had because without understanding what Christ had already done and accomplished, yeah, they they felt like Paul. In fact, there's a place in in the book of Acts that is talking about the entire ministry of Paul up to Rome. He's talking about that this guy is teaching people to worship, yeah, contrary to our laws. And one of those things is Paul telling people to come boldly into the holiest. Now, this was the work. If you look at the story of Paul, they started with Paul in Jerusalem. And those guys followed up Paul. They Paul, when, when Paul was before the governor, Governor Felix, you remember, those high priests appeared. The scribes and high priests. So there was a division between Sadducees and Pharisees. Because Paul says concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm, I'm in chains. He asked them, why is it so wonderful to believe that God can raise the dead? And when the Pharisees who believed in the resurrection of the dead heard that, they sided with Paul. But the Sadducees eh, were against Paul. Are, Are you getting my point? Then from there, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. All right? So now he says, if this guy had not appealed to Caesar, I would have released him. But now he has to go to Rome. So when he went to Rome, he had to wait for the accusers to arrive. 
The high priest was so angry with Paul. And this is one of the reasons. He is telling people to do what they are the only ones who are supposed to do. I, I, if, you, if you can get him, just wave. Are you getting? So there is this preacher that is telling people now, wait a minute. You can actually go into the holiest of all and see the Shekinah. Amen. And then he is telling them to go not by the blood of bulls or goats, but by the blood of Jesus. The blood of a human being, because they, call, they thought Jesus, they held Jesus to be a man, a human being. Uh, they called him the son of Joseph or the son of Mary. So they were shocked. They thought, yeah, this is blasphemy. This is sacrilege. How are you telling everybody now to go into the holiest of all with the blood of a man? So it was a confrontation of the entire sacrificial system of the Jews. Are you getting my point? And that's what I wanted you to see, that there is a background to this. And the anger that these people have, there is a background to that. So now, this person is telling people, you don't need to sacrifice animals anymore. You don't. So what do we do with the knives in the temple? <laughs> the entire system, are you getting? So it means that there are people in the temple who are going to be idle. They, no, not even idle. There is an entire industry of the marketing, buying, and selling of bulls and animals that's coming to an end. And some of these guys had interests. So you can understand the anger of these people. Amen. So Paul says to the Hebrews, he's writing to the Hebrews. Are you getting? So that is why in the New Testament, if you want to, re to really understand Christ versus the Hebrew or the Jewish worship system. Read the book of Hebrews. Because the details are so clear and open. This is basically almost nothing that Paul has not mentioned. He's talked about how the law was unprofitable. How the blood of Jesus is superior to the blood of animals. How Jesus is a superior high priest. And how his Ministry is endless. Alright? So, I can always tell, almost, when a person is fighting the gospel of Jesus Christ in terms of grace or uh, 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 the New uh, Testament or the New Covenant, when I hear the argument, I can tell uh, there is a certain book they have not read or understood. And anybody who is keeps on talking about law, 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 law. They have not read, understood Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews. Cindy, do you agree with me? Yeah. So as a believer, if you have not understood Romans, you have not understood Hebrews, you have not understood Galatians, then you do not understand the, the end of the law and the new covenant, the beginning of the new covenant. The danger is that you mix them as if there was no barrier, as if there is nothing that happened to terminate one and initiate another. And that is why understanding is important. For example, in Romans chapter 10 verse 4, in the Amplified Version, he says that Christ is the end of the law, the point at which it ceases to exist. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, he says that the law was supposed to bring us. It was a tutor, a steward, a caretaker. Or what we would call a house manager. Because that's what the Bible says. He says that the child, as long as he's a child, is under stewards. Those stewards are house managers. They tell the child when to drink porridge. How much of it to drink? They tell the child, although the house belongs, belongs to the child, the child cannot touch every, anything whatever they, at whatever time he wants or she wants. 
she has to depend on somebody to give them permission and actually to even give them what they need and want at the quantity that they want. Are you getting? But now the Bible says that, you know, so that the law served to us Jews. Not everyone, we are Gentiles who are never under the law. We were never under the law. We were never under the law. Okay? The Bible says that they were under the law as a trainer, a guardian, a guide to Christ to lead us until Christ came. Until Christ came, that we might be justified, declared righteous, put in right standing with God by and through faith. Verse 25. But now that faith has come. Now, they are using the word faith and Christ interchangeably. Because faith comes from Christ. It's the faith of Christ. I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now faith has come. We are no longer under the trainer, a guardian of our childhood. Can you imagine you? I don't know how old you are and I, want, I don't want to ask you. But can you imagine if the, 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 the person who took care of you when you were going to kindergarten, who raised you, you know, who used to, you, you were left with, the, with them when your mom went to work, went to shamba, maybe it's your older sister, maybe it's a cousin who came to stay with you, or if somebody was employed to take care of you, can you imagine if they were still following you around even now? Baby umekula, baby umeoga. Baby chanua nyuele. Baby, baby ya chakula ni baridi. He says that there is a time that you don't need that guardian. And that time is when Christ came. <laughs> Praise God. Is when Christ? Why? Because Christ came to cause, to bring and to give us Full access, not bit by bit. You remember under the law, and the prophets came, I appreciate my wife. When under the law and under the prophets, they were given revelations bit by bit. After 100 years, God speaks to somebody. After 300 years, God speaks. And after, you know, they went into, into Egypt, and they arose a king who knew not Joseph. They actually lasted 430 years without ever hearing the voice of God. Until God spoke to Moses, the backside of, de of the desert. I have heard the cry of my people and I've come down to deliver them. I want to send you to go and deliver them and I'll go with you. So he came in portions, portions, portions. But when Jesus comes now, he's not giving us a biscuit or cramps. He's not giving us small portions. He is giving us the entire package. So in Christ, God is not revealed in bits, but in Christ, the express image, the full image of God is revealed. And that is why when you read this word and understand it, the more you see of Christ, and that is what I began by saying, you can start stand in front of a mirror, but your focus is not your, your feet or your knees. Your focus is your face. And that's what you're seeing. But teaching and study reveals that whole picture. And that is why the word glory to glory comes in. When you are looking just at your face, trying, you know, you are totally captivated by your beautiful, beautiful, handsome face, trying to fix this and that, but you don't know the other parts. You understand? But the more you gaze into the mirror, you start to see the other parts. You still see your feet, you're standing in him. The Bible says now by faith we have access into this grace wherein we stand. You can even see where you are standing, that I am standing in grace. I have the right standing with God. Amen. You look at your feet, you can tell your walk in Christ. Praise the name of Jesus. Look at your hands, you can tell your fruitfulness in Christ. So you are able to see that entire picture. One as if you were sana. Yeah. And that is why you see believers who look at a part, they don't look at the whole picture. They look at a part. Therefore, you find some of them, 
they have such a revelation of Christ in a particular area. But their walk is wrong. Their stand is wrong. Because they have not gotten a picture. The entire picture. Remember this. The mirror reveals you. In Christ. So you can look at your, your, your face. Admire yourself. But you are not standing right. But that same mirror is the one that is supposed to show you. How you are supposed to stand or how you are standing. Are you following me? Praise the name of Jesus. So let's go back to the tabernacle. So it refers in verse 20. We were in verse 19. So we approach by the blood of Jesus. The Hebrews were being told. By a new and living way. Amen. Which he consecrated for us. How? Through the veil that is his flesh. Now this is very, very important. Through the veil that is his flesh. Now, in Israel, when in the tabernacle, for example, when you entered, the first area was called the court, the outer court. All right? There at the outer court, what was there was the, sac the, the altar of sacrifice and the lava of water. That is the water of purification. Amen. Can you get something that's more clear? It's a bit less congested. Praise the name of Jesus. So you enter. That's everybody. Anyone would come. They would come with their sacrifice. And it would be inspected and it would be slaughtered there. They would lay their hands on, on the head of the, of the animal to transfer their sin. Amen. That is the altar of sacrifice. The brazen altar. Praise God. You are seeing it out there. Amen. I wish we had a pointer. Alright. You are seeing that square, whatever. That's the altar. Towards the corner, the upper corner, the left-hand side corner, that is the water of purification, the lava. Yeah, lava, water of purification. Now this, yeah, when you're talking about them, you're talking about earth. Somebody say earth. They are, you're talking about the earth. Because whatever happened here, as far as Christ is concerned, Happened on earth. Where did Jesus die? So in heaven, Jesus did not go to die. He died here. So the earth is a type of an outer coat. Are you getting my point? So Christ died right here on earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He died on earth. One as if he were. Now, what happened on earth is that the blood was shed. Amen. At the same time that the blood was shed, there was water. What came out of the side of Christ? Blood and water. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So right there in that quote, there are two things that happened. Blood was shed and then there was the water of purification. And if you go to the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the Bible tells us there are three things that bear witness or testify on the earth. Can we read it together? One, two, go. There are three that bear witness in heaven. All right? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Amen. So the Word there is Christ. Our High Priest. Verse 8. In verse 8 we see, can we read again? One to go. And there are three that bear witnesses, witness on where are they bearing witness? On earth. Alright? Which ones are they? The spirit, the water, and the blood. 
And these three agree as one. So the blood and the water bear witness on earth. The Spirit, of course, has been poured. The Holy Spirit is working here on the other on earth. If you go to Revelation chapter 4, chapter 5, he says that he saw uh, 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 Manorah, the seven candlesticks. And the Bible says, yeah, they were the seven spirits of God that had been poured on the earth. Amen. They were the seven spirits of God that had been what? Poured on the earth. So you see here the scripture is telling us that the Holy Spirit is on the earth and the Holy Spirit is in heaven. How? He is omnipresent. If he was here and not there, could he be omnipresent? Please answer me. Could he be omnipresent? So he is omnipresent. One as if he were. So I submit to you friends that that outer court is symbolic of the earth. That is means that is where the sinner comes and accesses God. So that altar of sacrifice, the altar of the burnt offering, of the brazen altar was where the sinner found atonement. That is where the blood of the sacrifice was shed. Praise the name of Jesus. So Jesus also, remember, there was a no animal that was shed inside the holy place. All animals were, were, were killed there and the blood was shed there and collected in a bowl. So now the high priest would go beyond the, the, the other curtain. One as if he were. He would go beyond the other curtain. Amen. So Christ is that sacrifice. The Bible says, and here is another typology, that he suffered outside the gate. He died outside the gate. He's talking about the outer court. Praise the name of Jesus. The other thing we see is, of course, the water that cleanses. The cleansing. So anything to do with sin was dealt with there. All right? From that point on, the high priest had access and had access on behalf of the sinner. One as if he were. So from those two, the brazen altar and the water of purification, the high priest now could go inside. So there was a, another curtain. So he went into the place that is called the holy place. In that place called the holy place, what did we have there, if you, if you can remember? We had a shoe bread, 12 pieces of unleavened bread on one side. Okay? On the extreme side, we had the menorah. Now that's the table of shoe bread. On the left hand side, on the other side, we have the menorah. That is the seven candlesticks. Praise the name of Jesus. Now Jesus speaks and says that he is the bread that has come from heaven. He is not the bread that has come from the earth. Because after that cutting, now dimensions change. For those who love that word dimensions. We are no longer operating on the earth now. Praise God. And if you look at especially the book of Revelation, the three things that are there are mentioned. Of course, when we're talking about bread, we are talking about Christ. And in John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread that has come from the presence of the Father. Because what would happen, that bread would be kept there. Remember, it was made every day. 
every day. Are you getting? So after that, the only people that were allowed to eat of that bread were priests. So the bread was not thrown. It was never supposed to go to waste. It was never supposed to be thrown. When it was exchanged with fresh, the priests ate it. You remember in the book of Samuel, I think, David was running away from Saul. He went and asked, man, do you, do you have any food? He said, there's nothing here except the bread of the presence. He says, give me that. Let me eat that. So David ate the bread, the shoe bread, the unleavened bread which is a type of Christ. And you are told you are bread. Which kind of bread are you? Are you leavened or unleavened? Are you bread that is full of the leaven of the Pharisees? Or are you bread that is unleavened? Praise the name of Jesus. So Christ is this bread. He says, I am the bread that giveth life. He has come from heaven just like they would go and take that bread and go outside into the outer court and the Levites who are outside there ate. You remember also that during the feast of unleavened bread, worshippers came and offered the bread and ate in the outer court. So it means that is the bread that has come from heaven has come to the earth, which is the outer court. Praise God. And what is he doing? In the upper room, he is giving his 12 disciples, because there are 12 loaves. You understand? Even the one who betrayed him ate from the bread. The brother, he said, the one I will put the mosel into the cup. Are, are you getting? And the Bible says, when he ate from that bread, something different happened from the others. The Bible says Satan entered him. One has a few. You know, somewhere, and this preacher says that the Bible is very dangerous. His Bible is very dangerous. If somebody who does not understand the word of God and the gospel and the love of Christ takes it, and starts to, to preach can cause mayhem and confusion. Do you agree? Anyway, so the Bible says also in Revelation chapter 4, where we have read, that John looks and he, the, he sees the seven candlesticks in heaven, not on the earth. So we have moved from the earth now, we are in heaven. Praise God. We are in heaven. It says, and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne. Which are the seven spirits of God? Are you getting? So he sees that. The other thing we see is incense. I preached about it one day. And the Bible says that there was an angel who was given incense. So... You go through the curtain, is a table with 12 loaves. Here is a menorah, candlestick with seven branches. It's called a menorah. Right in the middle here is what is called the altar of incense, or what is called a golden censer. That's where incense rises from unceasingly every day and night. Bible says there has to always be fire there. Praise God. After that, now there is the curtain. This is the curtain that was, was rent as God was escaping from the enclosure. You understand? The day Jesus died, they were preparing for Passover. Somebody was anticipating to go into that cubicle and that cube, it was a cube actually, square, and himself to see the Shekinah by himself and come as the custom was, tell the others how the presence feels, the Shekinah glory of God. But that day, the Bible says they were in a hurry. They wanted Jesus to die in a hurry because they wanted to make preparation, Passover and Sabbath. But as they went, 
they found that there was a crack right in the middle of the temple. And all these things I'm talking about, they were lying on their side. They had been knocked down. God never needed them anymore. It's the end of typologies and shadows. The substance had come. The real bread had come. Why do you need loaves of bread? The true bread from heaven is here. The true light of the world. It says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when Jesus walked on the earth, he was the menorah. He was the light. In fact, the Bible says, in that city there shall not be candles. In that city there shall not be the sun. For him, his face is the sun, uh, is the light. Like the uh, brightness of seven suns. Why seven suns? The menorahs put together in one, shining from his face. He says, yeah, we, we will never need, praise God, these guys are amazing. And we read together, there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, no light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. His face, like the light of seven suns. He is the light. Somebody says, he's my light. One asks if you are a son. Says, I'm the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, and darkness can never comprehend it. One as if you will. Are you starting to see it now? Amen. Now, this is something I want to tell you. If you look at the covering, you, you take away the covering, the covering of, of the tabernacle. And you look at the furniture of the tabernacle from the top down. They form the sign of a cross. Alright? So it was altar of sacrifice, which is called a brazen altar. The lava the wa of water, which is a water of purification. Then you go through the curtain. Twelve unleavened bread, loaves of unleavened bread. The menorah. And here is what? Incense. The altar of incense. And you open the curtain. And right here is the Ark of the Covenant. Makes the sign. God was talking about the cross before the Romans even ever invented it. And now, listen to this. Not only that. When Israel journeyed through the desert and they got to the place where God wanted them to, to camp. People did not camp randomly or according to how they felt like. They arranged themselves, three tribes on this side, three tribes on that side, three tribes on this side, and then three tribes on the other side. When you looked at them from the top, they made the sign of a cross. That is why Balaam could not hex them. He could not cast them. Are you feeling what I'm saying? He told them. It's called the doctrine of Balaam. In, in the book of Revelation. He said, I have this against you. I know your works, but I have this against you because you have entertained the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam was this. After he was not able to bewitch them, he went to Balak. And he said, the only way is to introduce deception and a lying spirit in Israel and cause them to start to intermarry with the people of the land where God has caused them to dwell. And these people, the women of this land, will turn their hearts from God. And that time, 
you don't even need to cast them that was fulfilled in the book of judges seven times god raised the judges to warn them and to lead them and to deliver them from the captivity of the people in canaan and seven times they backslid seven times they went back of course you remember the classic example of samson who was so anointed his anointing was not just spiritual it manifested in physical strength this guy would come from the house of a harlot and pull out a gate now the city gate was not like this gate you pass here if somebody can pull out that gate that, that that's strength enough but those gates were high you remember what they say is the spies they said this the gates in these cities are high and thick the guy would shake it and instead of throwing it outside yeah he gave them a discount and put it on top of a hill mukitaka muichukue huko are you getting every battle he fought was because of a woman a gentile woman there is no time he fought because of a jewish or hebrew israeli or israelite woman he fought for gentile women the ones god had said don't touch and that became the pro- in the book of numbers 23 is where balaam was wondering what to do with these people these people are growing these people are mighty people are coming like locusts and we have heard what god has done for them in jericho how god has split the jordan and they are coming in our direction balak was panicking he was hysterical he was pay- he paid balam to cast a spell on these guys he tried seven times he would go to one hill and put a bull on the altar it didn't work he changed the other he thought the direction was a problem he went to the other side sacrificed a bull it didn't work he comes in the famous scripture at numbers 23 says how can i curse that which god has not cursed how can i denounce whom the lord has not denounced he says they've refused to be denounced now the doctrine of balam comes from this entice them introduce a lie into their hearts and that's the same thing that is happening now the amount of deception that is happening in our generation right now you better stay in the word amen paganism paganism has invaded christianity i'm telling you some of those things that are you're hearing in christianity right now we only used to hear it as 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 far as which doctors and guys i i remember in the 90s 94 95 96 if somebody went to the house of a divine or a witch doctor they were given water in a bottle to go and pour out their house i don't know whether you remember those who are there those days those years remember it was unheard of in church but it was hard when guys went to kario bangi dandora wherever is where those diviners were they were given water to shower with it to drink and to sprinkle around the house so us in 94 95 96 we knew this is witchcraft we knew it is what is happening now has become so accepted <laughs> praise the name of jesus where somebody thinks the spirit they were baptized in is not enough give me a bottle and i told you it comes when somebody has not understood understood the word you can perform miracle and lead people astray lead people from Christ my wife reminds me of this scripture and thank you so much honey as 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 my accountability partner she reminds me 
that a day will come where people will line up before Jesus and say, you performed miracles, but I was not in it. Who is this person who can perform miracles, signs and wonders, and Jesus is not there? How? Are you getting my point? It's called deception. One as if he were. Okay, let me go into this. So, you've gotten that point. The compartments, that there is the outer court, which is the earth. Then the holy place, now we are starting into heaven. Alright? Now there is the ark of the covenant, which is the throne room. If you see the throne room in heaven, nothing else is happening. But people casting down their crowns, prostrating themselves, crying, holy, holy. You're seeing a light. Are you getting? Light. That's Shekinah. The glory of God. Now, 10 minutes. Then I ask Minister Zippy to come close. Now, listen. The purpose of the tabernacle was so that God can dwell with them. That's what we have read. What was the purpose of the tabernacle? Number one, that build me a sanctuary that I can dwell with you. Sindio. So the purpose was so that God can dwell with them. The tabernacle also was to provide a means of approaching God. To obtain his blessings and favor. Now, the separation that came because of sin meant that God could not dwell in them. Therefore, God in his grace, in his goodness, all right, he looked for me and for you. Remember, even when Adam fell, God is the one who was looking for Adam. He said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I, I, I was naked. Who told you you were naked? And then after that, God kills an animal, the first sacrifice. God kills an animal and takes the skin. I don't know where the meat went. He takes the skin and covers them with the skin. Are you getting? Covers them because they had put leaves. Now leaves, it means every two, three days, they would have to change leaves. Because they start to fall, they dry up and wither and fall off. God said, okay, this is as far as your human effort can take. It's, it's like filthy rags. It's your righteousness. It's like filthy rugs. These leaves, is, 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 is that your best shot, Adam and Eve? So God says, let me show you. Takes an animal, takes the skin, covers them. Praise God. Now, he was telling them, I want to live and dwell among you. Do you want me to dwell among you? So he said, tell them to take an offering and only take from those who are willing. You know, there are things people do and they don't know that they are sending a statement. They are, they are speaking a statement. The failure to offer, that is why the Bible says, he did not compel them, he did not command them. But when he spoke to them, he said, God wants to dwell among us. He says, please don't give unless you are willing. If you want God to dwell among us, we build him a sanctuary, bring your offering. The Bible says they brought an offering until Moses told them, Imetosha, please don't bring any more. You remember that story? It's in this chapter. He told them, no, 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 it's enough. Don't bring any more. As a show that God is not only the one who wants us, but we also want him. Praise God. And that is why it's important to give towards the work of God. Because when you give, you're saying, I want this work to continue. I want the gospel to be preached. I want souls to be. We are not apathetic. Apathetic is insensitive to souls that are lost. If you can't preach, somebody else can preach. 
Give for the building of the church even if you will not worship in it. Even if you are getting a green card in three months. Give because it shows that I want the name of the Lord to be preached on Thicker Road in Nairobi in Kenya. It's about the heart. So he said, take it from the one who is willing. It is a show of willingness. So that we don't become insensitive or I don't care. You know, there is what is called the Hezekiah syndrome. The Hezekiah syndrome is that Hezekiah was given a prophecy and was told there are guys who are coming to invade Judah and they are going to plunder the temple. Hezekiah asked, when are they coming? He was told, they are coming, but not in your lifetime. Ah, when he heard in his, it's not in his lifetime, he said, if it's not in my lifetime, there's no problem. Those guys who are coming after me will deal with their own issues. They are guys with that, with that kind of mentality. Said, yeah, I, if the church is being built, they are giving too much, I'll just go across. What about a cross when they start to build? Or you go to the new church and they start to say, now we are building. Are you going to be church hopping just because you are avoiding to build God a sanctuary together with the other people? Are you feeling me? <laughs> so we were told, no, 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 wait a minute. If you want, do it. It's willingness. Tell your neighbor, willingness. And that is why Paul speaks and he says, if they are first be a willing heart. Everyone should give as they have decided, not out of compulsion. Meaning those who don't give is because they have decided not to give. Because it's not about amount. You remember, you can be generous with 50 bob. And you can be stingy with 5 billion dollars. It's about willingness. How much did the widow that Jesus was observing give? How much? Praise God. Are you still with me? So the tabernacle provided a means of approaching God. Where intercession could be made. And where blessing and benediction could be secured. So he said, anyone who wanted to worship. You remember I taught you about free will offering? That these ones you must give. Because you can't come before me without blood. Anytime you're approaching me, come with this. But wherever you are, if you ever feel like you want to offer God thanks, if you ever feel like you want to give God an offering, it's called free will, votive offering. It's not commanded, it's just free will. He said, I harvested, or I counted my flock, and I remembered that I had no flock. And when I counted, I saw how much God had blessed me. It is not Passover, it's not Feast of Tabernacle. It's not any of the other feasts. But I have come with a free will offering to tell God, thank you. Hallelujah. Free will, what? Offering. So you find that God dwelling in a person or there it used to be among them. But in Christ, we see that the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. Here is the first man. Amen. In whom God fully dwelt. God possessed him. His body was his temple. Was his dwelling place. God desires to do, desired to dwell in sanctuary. Now they could only do it with tent and furniture. But here is walking a man called Jesus Christ. Amen. And in that man, God had found a temple that he could dwell in his fullness. Fulfilling that divine desire. Of God to dwell among his people. Now he's not dwelling among his people. He dwells in his people. Somebody say Christ lives in me. Oh you're not believing that? The Bible says that your body may become wholly flooded with God himself. 
Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. You also are filled with the God get. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Somebody say, I'm filled with God. You have not received the spirit that is from the world. You know the spirit that is from the world is Satan. It's called the power, the prince of the powers of the air. According to Ephesians chapter 2. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He says, you have not received that spirit. But the spirit which is from God. Somebody say, I have the spirit of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So he says, can we read here together? One, two, go. For in him, the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form. Giving complete expression of the divine nature. Now this is where you come in. Read verse 10. One to go. Media. Verse 10. One to go. Let's read it. And me. Okay, read the way we read it. Say, and me. I am in him. Made full. And having come. To the fullness of life in Christ, I too am filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Put your hands together, give him praise. So you see now, Christ is not the only one indwelt by God. But you also... You are indwelt by God. Father, Son, Holy. Can you imagine what would happen if this thing would just settle in your heart? So if you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, where are you looking? What are you looking? Who are you looking for outside? He lives in me. Somebody say he lives in me. So, God has fulfilled his desire to dwell through what Christ has done. Number one, through Christ and then through you. Amen. The Bible says the tabernacle of God is with men. The residence of God is with men. The maskan, it's called a maskan. The maskan, in Arabic, in Hebrew, is called maskan. The maskan, the place of his rest, is with men. Somebody say, he lives in me. One as if he were. Are you getting something today? So Jesus is also access, guaranteed access to the Father. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am the door. By me, if any man enter, John chapter 10, 10 verse 9, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find a pasture. Then John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said unto him, can we read it together? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father Except through me. So there are no two ways to the Father. Is there another alternative route? There's no gate to be to the Father. Jesus is the only way to the the only access, the only approach. And he says, Come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. He says, He who comes to me, I will no wise cast away. I will never chase you. Come boldly before the throne of grace. We have found an access. Free access. The Bible says by the same spirit. We have access to God, to the Father. We have access. Somebody say, I have access. Yeah, we have access to God. Amen. We are not approaching. We have approached. We live in him. He lives in us. Why? Because we have gotten a living way. We have gotten a new and a living way. A guaranteed way. 
You know, in Israel, when they came, they came ish ish, 50 50. They might be accepted, they might not. They might get favor, they might not. They might get blessing, they might not. There was no guarantee under the law. But here there is a sure way. It's called a sure and living way. That is Jesus Christ. That when you come by faith, you are guaranteed to be accepted among the beloved. The door is open for you. Praise the name of Jesus. Are you happy? Praise the name of Jesus. So Jesus is the only way to the Father. I want to finish by telling you this. Amen. The temple, the tabernacle, where the outer court, where I told you, was the place of sacrifice and service. The Levites served without rest. They served tirelessly day and night. The sacrifices were without end. As long as, as soon as somebody had sacrificed, there was need for another sacrifice. As soon as the, the fire had been put charcoal, yeah, they had to wait again and come and refill. The incense had to be refilled. But here, in Christ Jesus, we have found a fire that burns. Oh, you know, Johan, when people say fresh fire, is there ever old fire? And as Bonke is asking that. Bonke used to ask, he says, is there ever f- old fire? Fire is, old. If fire is like a river. The river, the channel might be old, but the water is always new. Are you hearing me? You know, one day I wanted to bamboozle my kids, especially my youngest daughter. I wanted to bamboozle her. I said, babe, can I tell you something? Yeah. You see, this water we are drinking is the water that was there in the days of Noah. So she thinks, huh? So yeah, it's the same water. God has not created any fresh water. It's still the same. He said, now there is that fire that came upon the 120. That fire never gets old. That fire burns. Praise God, even now, you'll discover you still have that fire. Hmm? You know, other people refer to, oh, hey, kuna ule brother na kuaga fire, fire. Na kuaga fire. No, even you, you are fire. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor you are fire. The uh, Bible says he makes his ministers. How many are you ministers of Christ? Let me see. He makes his ministers what? Flames of fire. So the flames of fire are people. Not a golden lampstand in, in a room that only one person has access. Right now, if you look in the spirit, you're burning. You are fire. Somebody say, I'm a flame of fire. Praise God. Have you gotten something today? So Christ was the perfect servant. Christ was faithful as a son. He served as a son. He was so faithful that he willingly offered himself to die. He willingly offered himself. He gave himself to fulfill the Father's will. Philippians 2. So, as we close... The tabernacle was a shadow of the perfect sanctuary in heaven. Perfect. Can you tell me, after I've taught that, uh, that much, can you tell me which part of the tabernacle that is not in heaven? There's a part of the tabernacle that's not in heaven. It's called the outer court. That is the place where sinners would tread as they bring their offering. But heaven, there is no place for sinners to tread. This is where decisions are made. Anyone who will tread heaven must be redeemed. No longer a sinner. Kamu mejika inuwa mkono upunga, punga mkono. Are you getting? So that compartment that is called the outer court is here on the earth. The rest up there. Amen. 
Praise God. So that sanctuary is not built with human hands, but God himself. That heavenly sanctuary is served by one priest right now. His name is Jesus, the high priest, who is also our perfect intercessor. Whoever liveth to make intercession. The tabernacle is a place of intercession. You remember Hannah. When Hannah was childless, she would go to the tabernacle after giving her offering or sacrifice. The one that Elkanah, her husband, had given her, she would pour her, her heart. She would cry out to God. It was a place of intercession. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Solomon said, if anybody should come to this house and lift up their voice and pray and seek your face, hear thou from heaven. It was a place of intercession. The tabernacle was a place where when they needed to pray or they needed to be prayed for, they would go. Now Christ has become our intercessor. And me and you have become intercessors in Christ with the spirit of intercession. I will pour upon them the spirit of grace and what? Supplication. Amen. So it was a shadow. The heavenly sanctuary has only ever received one sacrifice. And it was enough. The business of sacrificing was done. What continues there is mediation and intercession. And of course, worship. They worship. Worthy are you for you are slain. But as far as shedding blood is concerned, one was enough. That sanctuary never received a sacrifice before Jesus went with his own sacrifice. And when he offered it, it was fully accepted and there was no need for another sacrifice. Wow. Praise God. So it's a sanctuary that only knows one blood. The blood that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. One blood, the blood of Jesus. And the Bible says, by that blood, he has entered into the holiest of all. That is the throne room. The throne room of God. He has entered into the holiest of all in heaven by his own blood. Now me and you are told, now you get up and go into the holiest of all by that same blood. You have free access. <laughs> now listen. You know in those days, every time they wanted to enter, they had to kill an animal, get it in a bowl, the blood in a bowl, and they would enter. Alright? They would enter. Are you getting? So tomorrow, or next week, or next year, they would do the same. Kill an animal, get the blood, enter. Alright? But us, we are told, you enter. Not only me. Okay? Come here, friends. Let me use you. He wants to enter. So I don't go kill my own animal. Then I enter with the blood. And then you kill your own. Get your own blood. Just do your hands like this. Alright? He kills their own and then everyone is going with the a, with a, with a, with a blood of a lamb or an animal. No, no, no. And then we are not supposed, it does not mean that I have the blood of Jesus, then he carries the blood of Jesus, then he carries the blood of Jesus, then he carries the blood of Jesus. And then we enter with that blood. Yeah, Simungia. All right? That's not what it means. Let's go back. It means when the blood was shed and presented, it remains there. 
So he suffers no more. He dies no more. His blood cannot be shed anymore. He's once and for all. He remains there. All right? So when I go, I go by the blood that is already there. So if somebody gets saved this evening, yeah, they also enter the holiest of all by the blood that is already there. So it doesn't mean you go look for the blood of Jesus. No, the blood of Jesus is already there, shed for your access. It's there for you. It is there speaking better things than the blood of Abel. He said, now what you are missing, I give it to you. I give you power and I give you authority.